Times like these make it especially important to fight bad science and misinformation. The latest in the slew of misinformation surrounding this COVID-19 pandemic is a new documentary called Plandemic. If I had to describe this documentary in one word, I really couldn't. They jump from topic to topic faster than a parkour athlete. So what I'm going to be doing in this video is breaking down the first half or so of the video to show you that it really makes no sense and you should not believe a single word of it. So let's start from the beginning. Dr. Judy Mikovits has been called one of the most accomplished scientists of her generation. No, Judy Mikovits has not been called one of the most accomplished scientists of our time. Now, I'm not one to usually focus on credentials. I always say that it's more important to focus on what someone says and what information they bring to the table than it is to focus on what degree they have. Someone can have a PhD and still be wrong. But in this case, this entire documentary centers around this interview with Judy Mikovits, and right off the bat, they're trying to build her up to be someone she's not. At the same time, they never actually go into the details of her career and her history, which I think are really important for understanding the wacky stuff she ends up saying in this documentary. So let's get it out of the way and just go over Judy's journey. The first relevant time point starts in 1988, where with a bachelor's degree, Judy starts working as a laboratory technician for Francis Rossetti at the National Cancer Institute. In 1991, she receives her PhD in biochemistry from George Washington University while working on HIV. That's good, she did some solid work here. But you don't revolutionize the world with a PhD thesis. So let's keep looking for any reason why we can call her one of the most accomplished scientists of our time. In 1996, she is hired as a scientist in Frank Rossetti's lab at the National Cancer Institute. But then in 2001, she leaves the National Cancer Institute to work for a drug discovery company in Santa Barbara, California, which ultimately failed. Then by 2005, she is bartending in California. In 2007, she is hired to direct research at the Whitmore Peterson Institute, a facility started by wealthy philanthropists to study chronic fatigue syndrome. Because Judy had previously worked with viruses, she believed that a virus caused chronic fatigue syndrome. And in 2009, she published a paper claiming just that in the journal Science. Now, getting published in Science is a pretty big deal, so lots of other researchers tried to replicate her results in order to build on them. But in September 2011, the paper was ultimately retracted after multiple labs failed to reproduce her results and also demonstrated that her results were likely due to contamination. Then in September of 2011, Judy is fired from the Whitmore Peterson Institute. In November of 2011, she is then arrested for stealing materials from that institute. Then in 2012, she herself participates in a study that confirmed her work was wrong. This is just science at work, where results are checked and rechecked in order to make sure that the initial conclusion is still true, and when it's not, we correct it. Now we fast forward two years to 2014, where Judy Mikovits resurfaces as a speaker at Autism One, the largest anti-vaccine conference in the country, where she makes the claim that Zika, Ebola, and West Nile viruses were all produced in a lab. And so that brings us to today, where Judy has continued this trend of speaking at anti-vaccine conferences and making wild claims about biology until she is featured in this pandemic documentary, which takes the story that I just told you and spins it in a completely false way in order to make you think that she has been shut up by the pharmaceutical industry. So you made a discovery that conflicted with the agreed upon narrative. <laughs> Correct. And for that, they did everything in their powers to destroy your life. Correct. You were arrested. Correct. And then you were put under a gag order. Um, for, for five years, if I went on social media, if I said anything at all, they would find new evidence and, um, and put me back in jail. Like I said, she got published in Science, and it was for an idea that wasn't necessarily against the conventional wisdom. It was just a new idea. And after it was checked out, it was found to be false. Then she was arrested for a completely different reason, stealing materials from her previous employer. And so what did they charge you with? Nothing. But you were in jail. I was held in jail with no charges. I was called a fugitive from justice. Judy was held in jail for five days after her previous employer filed charges of theft against her. The charges were eventually dropped. They said, if you don't find 
the notebooks if you don't find the material, which was not in my possession, but planted in my house. As if you took intellectual property from the laboratory. Is yes. that correct? It was, it was intended to appear as if I took confidential material names and intellectual property from the laboratory. So let's just get this story straight. These all-powerful forces that want to silence Judy Mikovits do it by filing charges of theft against her and then holding her in jail for five days, only to ultimately drop the charges, after which she's free to do science again, which she does a year later. And then she writes a book in 2014 and again in 2020. If you ask me, these guys really need to work on their world domination skills. Yet you sit here. <laughs> I think a lot of people would probably have just taken the retirement out early, laid low, but you have decided to come forth when your gag order has been released. Oh, and to clarify that gag order, she just wasn't allowed to talk about her court case, which again had nothing to do with her science until the court case was finished. To write a book called Plague of Corruption, Restoring Faith in the Promise of Science, and you are naming names. Absolutely. Apparently their attempt to silence you has failed. So Anthony Fauci. My name is uh, Dr. Tony Fauci. I'm the director of the... The man who is heading the pandemic task force was involved in a cover-up. He directed the cover-up. And in fact, everybody else was paid off and paid off big time. Millions of dollars in funding from Tony Fauci, Tony Fauci's organization, National Institute of Allergy and Infectious Disease. These investigators that committed the fraud continue to this day to be paid big time by the NIAID. This is weird because she's referring to a situation in 2012, after the charges against her had been dropped, where, at the request of Anthony Fauci, a research project headed by Dr. Ian Lipkin involving multiple institutions was started to try and confirm her previous results where she found a virus that she thought caused chronic fatigue syndrome. And she was part of this project. She was asked to work on it and paid to do so. And the results were that the virus wasn't there. It wasn't in these chronic fatigue syndrome patients' samples. She even acknowledged this herself in a press conference. That conclusion is also consistent with previous results produced by other labs, which initially got her paper retracted. So the idea that she was sabotaged and that everybody else was paid off, there's just no evidence for that. And the whole world is listening to his advice for how to handle this current pandemic. How do we know that what he's saying is what we need to be learning? What he's saying is absolute uh, propaganda and, and the same kind of propaganda that he's perpetrated to kill millions since 1984. It started really when I was 25 years old. I was part of the team that isolated HIV from the saliva and blood of the patients from France where Luc Montagnier had originally isolated the virus. This was a confirmatory study, but Tony Fauci and Robert Gallo were working together then to spin the story in a different way. At that time, Dr. Rossetti was out of town, and Tony Fauci says, um, you know, we understand that you have a paper in press, and we want a copy of it. And I said, yes, there's a paper in press, and it's confidential, and no, I will not give you a copy of it. <laughs> he started screaming at me, then he said, give us the paper right now, or, or you'll be fired for insubordination. And I just said, I'm sure when Dr. Rossetti gets back, you can have the conversation. And so Frank comes back, you know, several weeks later, and is really bullied into giving Fauci the paper. Fauci holds up the publication of the paper for several months, while Robert Gallo writes his own paper and takes all the credit, and of course patents are involved. This delay of the confirmation, you know, literally led to spreading the virus around, um, you know, killing millions. This story is fishy at best. The battle over who figured out that HIV causes AIDS is a battle between two scientists named Robert Gallo and Luc Montigny. Ultimately, Luc Montigny won that battle and was awarded the Nobel Prize for his discovery. Now, 
Anthony Fauci is not involved in that story at all. So why he would be trying to hold this paper up so that Robert Gallo could write his first is not clear at all. Anthony Fauci and Robert Gallo hardly ever even collaborated, and throughout their whole careers of publishing hundreds of papers each, they only ever published two papers together, and they were not related at all to the discovery of HIV causing AIDS. Perhaps no one expressed the anguish of AIDS better than New York writer Larry Kramer. For the record, Larry Kramer later called Anthony Fauci the only true hero among government officials during the AIDS crisis. If we activate mandatory vaccines globally, I imagine these people stand to make hundreds of billions of dollars that own the vaccines. And they'll kill millions, as they already have with their vaccines. There is no vaccine currently on the schedule for any RNA virus that works. Uh, last I checked, we have vaccines against measles, mumps, rubella, rotavirus, polio, and rabies. Those are all diseases caused by an RNA virus, and the vaccines all work. So I have to ask you, are you anti-vaccine? Oh, absolutely not. I'm, in fact, vaccine is immune therapy, uh, just like interferon alpha is immune therapy. So I'm not anti-vaccine. My job is to develop immune therapies. That's what vaccines are. In my book, if you deny the science of vaccines like Judy just did, then you are an anti-vaxxer. So congratulations, Judy. You can add anti-vaxxer to your stellar resume. Do you believe that this virus was created in a laboratory? I wouldn't use the word created, but you can't say naturally occurring if it was by way of the laboratory. So it's very clear this virus was manipulated, These, this family of viruses was manipulated and studied in a laboratory where the animals were taken into the laboratory, and this is what was released, whether deliberate or not. That cannot be naturally occurring. Somebody didn't go to a market, get a bat, the virus didn't jump directly to humans. That's not how it works. That's accelerated viral evolution. If it was a natural occurrence, it would take it up to 800 years to occur. This occurred from SARS-1 within a decade. That's not, that's not naturally occurring. Are we sure that this woman used to be a virologist? 800 years? Where on earth does she get that number? Look, the fact of the matter is that we have the whole genome sequenced from SARS-CoV-2, the virus that causes COVID-19. And from that genome, we can absolutely tell without a shadow of a doubt that it was not engineered in a lab. We would see clear evidence for that in its genome if that were the case. What we do see is 96% similarity to another coronavirus that was isolated from bats in 2015. That similarity tells us that this coronavirus likely has its origins in a bat, but nobody really thinks that it jumped directly from bats to humans. We think that it first infected an amplifier host, a different animal, and from that animal it was then able to more easily make the jump to humans. This is exactly what we saw with the first SARS outbreak in 2003, which was also caused by a coronavirus that originated in bats. It's also what we see for other viruses throughout history. So despite her being a virologist, she doesn't seem to understand the basics of zoonoses. And do you have any ideas of where this occurred? Oh, yeah. I'm sure it occurred between the North Carolina laboratories, Fort Detrick, the U.S. Army Research Institute of Infectious Disease, and the Wuhan laboratory. $3.7 million flowed from the National Institutes of Health here in the U.S. to the Wuhan lab in China, the same lab where many people have said that this coronavirus infection first originated. Yeah, that money funds projects that help scientists figure out where coronaviruses are coming from, how we can track them, and how we can ultimately treat them. That sounds like something we want to invest in, right? In 1999, I was working in Fort Detrick in USAMRID there, and my job was to teach Ebola how to infect human cells without killing them. Ebola couldn't infect human cells until we took it in the laboratories and talked to them. Wait a minute. Did she just say that she was working at Fort Detrick teaching Ebola viruses 
how to infect human cells because unless you teach them, they can't. And this was in 1999. Does she not know that the first Ebola virus outbreaks were recorded in 1976? Were those also from a lab? Oh my god. All right, that's all I can really handle with this documentary right now. From here, they just go into parkour mode, jumping from topic to topic without ever explaining anything while making wild claims. So that's it for now. If you want me to debunk the rest of the video, let me know, and I'll consider torturing myself so you don't have to. But for now, I'm Dr. Wilson, this has been Debunk the Funk, and I do hope you've enjoyed it.